Yeah, so we're about 150 people uh, right now. We'll hire about another 100 people this year. Um, we main office is in, in London. We have other offices in China, um, Australia, Ireland, and kind of the US in New York. So sort of you really have to differentiate on providing the best possible product to people and the best possible service and experience to people at the same time. Alrighty, hello everyone and welcome to the Deal Maker Show. So today we have a founder that is pretty impressive. I mean, the story that he has, I mean, everything starting at 14 years old. I mean, it's pretty mind blowing, uh, but we're going to be learning quite a bit. You know, the ups, the downs, the really the exploring, the whole thing of building, scaling, financing, you name it. And especially at a very, very early stage. So I guess without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest today, Christian Owens. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. So originally from there, from the UK. So how was life growing up? It was good. It was good. I grew up in a, a pretty small town, um, kind of pretty sleepy. Uh, and that probably is why I now spend most of my time online because I discovered it really early. Um, but no, it was a good, a good, good life growing up. And obviously growing up very early into computers. So how did you get your hands on computers and, and code for the very first time, Christian, because I know that you developed that that love right away. Oh, absolutely. So my I forget exactly how I kind of came to have my first computer, but I remember um, kind of sort of 12, 13, sort of somewhere around there, um, we, I think, got a computer, inherited one uh, from somewhere, and I kind of just became fixated on it. Uh, from the moment uh, that we got it in the house. And obviously it was kind of dial up internet and stuff like that back then. And I think I used it for the first like six months before us getting internet and kind of just exploring every possible part of it. Um, and then sort of, uh, I think the revelation for me was I, I think I bought a book or kind of took a book from the library or something, which was about like HTML uh, or something like that. And I found it just fascinating that you could kind of like type characters into this thing um, and you could end up with something kind of out of it that you could see and you could use and you could play with. Um, and that kind of really sparked my fascination with, with computers and, and technology pretty early on. And I think from about kind of 11, 12, 13, somewhere around there, um, I started building websites for people. Um, so I kind of go door to door almost uh, in the town that I grew up in to kind of local businesses or restaurants or whatever it was. Um, and I'd be like, I can make you a website. Um, and I didn't really charge them anything for doing it. It was like a kind of hundred dollars or hundred pounds or something like that. Um, and kind of, that's really, really how I started. And then how do you really get serious into this? Because obviously at age 14, you were already making a killing. So, uh, at what point do you yeah. realize that, Hey, I can actually make good money out of this. So, I mean, I was really building websites for people kind of for the fun of it more than anything else. Like I was just like tinkering, really enjoyed making stuff. Um, and then I remember like, I can't exactly remember exactly the moment that it happened, but one of these businesses, I think it was like an Italian restaurant or something that I was making a website for. We got to the end when they were supposed to pay me this sort of like pretty small amount of money. And they were like, can I have an invoice? And like me, kind of 12, 13, whatever it was, was like, what on earth is an invoice? Like, I've never even heard of this before. So I Googled it and kind of like a bunch of, like a ton of different invoicing software and, and stuff came up. Um, and I think one of them was QuickBooks and I like clicked on it and it was like 10 pounds a month or something for this this piece of software. And I was like, I'm not paying 10 pounds a month. I can build this. Um, so I kind of, at that point, started teaching myself how to like code and build software um, and the first thing that I built was kind of really to scratch my own itch kind of around this invoicing thing was, um, it was like invoicing software for people who did kind of freelancing or time billing or kind of project-based billing or whatever it was. It wasn't super, wasn't super fancy. Um, didn't have a ton of functionality, but it kind of worked for the very like narrow purpose, um, of what it was. So I started, um, kind of building that initially using it myself. And then I realized I became obsessed with building software as opposed to building these websites for people. And kind of, as I started building software, I realized, well, kind of 
I'm not actually making websites for people anymore, so I'm not making any money. Maybe I could just sell this invoicing software to people who needed it. And started doing that in, in kind of like 2013-ish. Um, sorry, when I was about 13-ish. Um, and then kind of from, from that point, started making a couple of sales and, and things like that. And kind of gradually made the product a little bit better and then made a few more sales and made the product a bit better and made a few more sales. And kind of before I knew it, kind of six months later, we'd, we'd done sort of three or 400,000 in, in revenue. And I was sort of 14 year old with actually a real business. Um, and fast forward kind of 18 months from then, um, we were a kind of four or five million run rate kind of software company. Um, with kind of a bunch of remote people who are helping with things like support and, and, and sort of all this stuff. I mean, that's a lot of money for, for a 14 or 15 year old. I mean, were your family concerned that maybe you were, you were dealing drugs on the street or something like that? <laughs> like maybe there was like, this, where there, the hell is that money coming from? So there was this really interesting, there was a very kind of poignant, like funny moment, um, I think in my like childhood, uh, that I remember which was my parents had zero idea or doing any of this stuff. Like they knew I was building websites for people and occasionally like I'd get a check or something. And like I didn't, I had like a kid's bank account at the time that didn't accept checks. Um, and they would always write the checks out in my dad's name. So whenever I made money doing this, um, this website stuff, like they would have to take me to the bank and they would put the check in the account and then they would take the cash out and then I'd put it in my own account. Um, and these were like not big checks. They're like 50, 100 pounds, something like that. Um, but I remember one day, like we went and we did that and sort of this was back when when you went to the the bank certainly in the uk i don't know if, if it was the same in other countries as well but um for the account that i had you had like a little book um and it was like a little book that like had instead of getting bank statements you would have a book and every time you go into the bank you'd hand over this book and it was like, like a little passport um and they would like dot matrix print in the next line of the statement with like your balance in it and i remember one day going in with with my mother and sort of to deposit like a hundred pounds or something i handed over the book and they they gave it back to me and like the balance read sort of it went from like 70 pounds 120 pounds sort of 96 pounds and then the most recent line was just like seventy four thousand pounds and that led to the conversation with my parents which was just like what on earth have you been doing on the internet um, kind of that has led to you having 74,000 pounds in a kid's savings account. Um, and then that led us to going to like a little coffee shop around the corner and like me being like, well, I've been building this invoicing software and we've been selling it on PayPal and like kind of doing all this stuff. Um, and then sort of from there kind of, they were initially like incredibly skeptical of like, what is he doing on the internet? Is he selling drugs? Like, what is it? What is this? And then to like, once they understood it, obviously like super supportive of, of what it is I was, I was trying to do and what I was trying to build. I mean, looking back, because I guess at, at 14, you're, we're still kind of like, I guess, uh, developing, you know, maturing, growing, uh, shaping up the personality, the experiences. Mm. I mean, were, were you at that point able to realize that, that that was a lot of money. Um, I th I would like to say yes, um, but like I didn't come from a I didn't come from a family where we had tons of money. Like my 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 dad like worked in a in a factory. My mum, she was a kind of company secretary for like a local like engineering company. Um, and like, we never like wanted for anything, we were never hungry or, or anything like that, but we by no means sort of like had a ton of money. Like we went on kind of one holiday every other year or something like that and, um, and things like that. So sort of, it's not like we were rich. Um, and then when this happened, um, kind of, so I never, and I, it was always a very like open, like we were always very open about like sort of, oh, we can't do that until the end of June because that's when we'll have enough money. We will have saved up enough money to go and go on this trip or like do whatever it is. Um, so, but like at that point, I was always very curious um, and kind of it all happened, I think like with everything in, in sort of business that I've learned to date, it kind of happened very slowly and then all at once. It was like nothing, 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 nothing for a really long time. And then something kind of clicked. Um, and then it really started working. So I, I'm not sure I was able, I definitely understood that it was a lot of money. 
Um, but I don't think I understood sort of that that's more money than like kind of the average person makes in like two in, in the UK that more than the average person makes in like two or three years. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so in this case for you guys, I mean, you build this up to 5 million in revenue in 18 months. Uh, and, and essentially as this is starting to grow, you start to also have the exposure to all the admin, you know, the, you know, the taxes, you know, more like the boring uh, part of it, which mm. Essentially, it was the segue for you to understand, I think that there's something else that could be much bigger than this. So so what happened during that time? Yeah, so we were kind of, and I say we, so I, I hired a couple of people remotely that I'd never met, um, sort of one of which is a, a guy called Harrison, who ended up being the co-founder of my current business with me. Um, and basically what happened was sort of we were scaling this business and for context, we were selling invoicing software to freelancers. So this was not a high price product. I think it was sort of like 70 or 80 bucks a year. Um, and we were selling it to everybody in every country that you can imagine. So sort of very quickly, it went from like, oh, this is fun. Like we get a few transactions here and there through PayPal and, and kind of that works and, and sort of to there was a transition point at some point where it went from being like, this is fun. I'm building this thing that I like to, oh, this is a real business and we have to act like one. Um, so I had to learn about a lot of this stuff really quickly. So a lot of this stuff was um, things like kind of how do you deal with cash? Like how do you make sure you pay people on time? How do you um, deal with kind of taxes, like sales taxes and VAT and then multiply that by, oh, how do you do that in Germany? How do you do that in Japan? How do you do that in all these different places? How do you deal with foreign currencies and, and things like that? How do you start taking credit cards as well as PayPal, as well as bank transfers and all of this stuff? Um, and at some point, probably like 18, 24 months in or so, or so um, and this was just after, so I was like 16, 17, and I convinced my parents to let me drop out of school when I was 16 to kind of do this full time. Um, and kind of around that same point, I kind of like got this itch, which was like the, the reason that I started doing this in the first place was because I really liked building a thing. I really liked building software and solving a problem and then doing the kind of marketing and selling and partnerships and, and all of that stuff. And then at some point I realized I was spending far more of my day on kind of all of this stuff that wasn't doing any of that stuff. It wasn't going and figuring out what the next marketing campaign was or building the next feature. It was like, oh, we've just hit this sort of 1 million yen a year kind of sales tax threshold in Japan. And now we need to file for local sales taxes in Japan. And we need to hire a Japanese local tax agent to file them for us and we need to pay them in yen. Um, and it kind of, all of this stuff was just like really painful and, and sort of laborious to, to deal with. Um, and like through this process, like one of the ways that we'd grown the business is we'd, we'd been putting together these like bundles of, of software. So we've been going to, so we were invoicing software for freelancers. We've been going to like, okay, what are other tools that freelancers use it use so be like we found like people who are building project management software or people who were building kind of time time tracking tools or crms or whatever it was and one of the ways that we'd grown was we'd partner with these people and we'd put together a, a package where you would get and a project management invoicing sort of some other thing and some other thing and you would pay if the retail price of this stuff was 400 dollars a year you'd pay 99 a year um, and we'd all acquire a bunch of customers from each other and, and, and things like that. So like through doing that and that being one of the ways that we'd grown, we kind of amassed, even though I was kind of 16, 17 at the time, I had amassed a reasonable like network of other people who were running software companies as well. And one day I kind of just got frustrated with all this stuff I was doing in the background, all of this like admin kind of taxes stuff. And I kind of just sent an email to everybody who we'd worked with. And I was like, I am really kind of, at the end of my rope in terms of like kind of dealing with all this stuff, like, and I kind of listed something like taxes and payment processing and we get chargebacks or fraud or whatever it is. Like, how do you guys deal with this? And I got a bunch of replies. Um, and that was probably the moment that I learned, like people are really passionate in two scenarios when they really love something or when they really hate it. Um, and like the group of people that came back universally really hated this like problem. Um, 
and kind of the group, the, the kind of responses kind of came back and you could kind of group them in two ways. Um, one group of people were people saying that kind of similar to me, they're software developers. They kind of built a bunch of stuff that they'd sort of hacked together in the background to make their lives easier um, to deal with all of this stuff. And then the other group of people were like, we're using these sort of outsourced like e-commerce platforms. So things like at the time it was um, kind of product because like Stripe and things didn't exist. At the time it was uh, things like Digital River and kind of Demandware and, and things like that. Um, and we're kind of using those things, but they're probably not fit for you because it costs like a million bucks a year just to get started with these things. And you pay a bunch of money every time you want to change something in professional services fees. So to me, like neither of those two options to solve the problem seemed like a great idea. It was either continue doing the thing that you're already doing of like hacking some stuff together. Um, and eventually as the business gets big enough, maybe hire some people to deal with that stuff. Or it was use one of these platforms that was built in like the early 90s um, that is going to take away all of these headaches, but is going to be super expensive um, for, for you to run and deal with. And sort of like that was kind of like the initial like aha moment for, for me when, when it came to like what was next. And I was like having a conversation with Harrison, who's my co-founder at Paddle, but was um, kind of one of the people I'd... Um, hired in to work on like business development and, and things like that at the the invoicing company. Um, and we were both kind of like riffing on this stuff and like, wouldn't it be great if a thing just existed that solved all these problems that was not built like 20 years ago? Um, and sort of after kind of a few discussions about that, we were like, you know what, screw it, let's do it. Let's kind of go and build that. Um, so we essentially kind of over the next like three or four months kind of got the business into shape where um, like a lot of this stuff was automated kind of, we had people who were doing things like customer support and it didn't require us day to day to go in and dive in and solve problems. And it like really transformed it into what was a quite a fast growing business into what was more look, looked more like a lifestyle business kind of thing that ran mostly on autopilot. We hired somebody to come and run that, that kind of uh, invoicing software company. Um, and then Harrison and I, kind of moved to London um, from kind of, we were both uh, across different parts of the country. We moved to London to kind of really tackle this problem that we both had in running this other company, which was how do you deal with all of that other stuff that comes with building and growing and running a software company? So all of this administrative back office, um, kind of boring stuff more than anything else, like how do you deal with all that? And that was a problem that we wanted to go and solve. So how old were you? At this point, Christian. Um, so I think I was 17, just about to turn 18, and Harrison's like kind of three months older than me. Um, so he was just 18 as well. Um, and we moved to London in, yeah, like August, August or September, like 2012. Um, we like rented a little house, like flat together, lived together, probably like, actually for like the first four years of the company. Um, but kind of, um, we kind of just took the plunge and we were like, look, kind of, I think I was, I just turned 18 when we actually made the move, but we were planning it, um, a little bit earlier than that. Um, moved out on mother's day. Um, so never do that is a tip for anybody listening. <laughs> <who's>, <laughs> never, ever move out on mother's day. Cause I have not heard the end of it even to this day, a decade later. Wow. So, so in your case, you moved to London. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. here uh, you start the company, Paddle, and essentially you raise your seed round. You raise that from from one single guy, which offer you some space mm -hmm. in their office. And I guess that as a result of this, you know, things started to really get some momentum. Just so that the people that are listening and watching, you know, get a really understanding of of what ended up the, being the business model of Paddle. What is the business model? How do you guys make money, and how does it work? Yeah, so we build a platform, we call it a revenue delivery platform, um, which essentially is doing all of that back office stuff for software companies. So a software company or a business that's selling software signs up to Paddle and we manage everything from basically the point at which a customer clicks buy through to that like ongoing relationship. So it's everything to do with um, sort of subscription billing for kind of SaaS products. 
invoicing for kind of sales assisted software products. Um, but then all of the recurring and subscription billing, kind of price optimization, payments, um, currencies, and then all of the underlying kind of taxes and sort of things like that. So we not only, so we're not sort of um, just a sof- software product, we're kind of like a software services product where on the tax side of things, for example, like, yes, we're dealing with all the subscription billing, but we're also collecting all of the money for the taxes, filing the tax returns on behalf of the businesses and remitting the money to the the tax authorities. So it's really trying to, all of the things that basically I hated when I was running the business it, are all of the things that we try and solve now with a single kind of integration that these, these software companies do. Very cool. So up until now, I mean, how much capital have you guys raised for Paddle? Uh, so to date, we've raised about $100 million. But I think it's just shy of that, like 98 and I know that for you, the fundraising journey has been pretty um, pretty unique. I mean, unique experience. I mean, from the guy that f- seated you, 150000 just to uh, go and spend some time at their office, to even pitching a venture capital firm without a deck at 18 years old. I mean, how, how was that? Yeah, I mean, so even the seed round, so that seed, that 150 k initially, so um, we met once. And actually the way that we were met is sort of, I replied to a tweet that he did. um, And I can't even remember what it was about. Um, But he, I replied to a tweet and he was like, yeah, come meet me or like whatever. And we had one meeting. And at the end of the meeting, he was just like, you know what? Like sort of you're 18. Like I have no idea if this is going to work. He built a technology business, but not a business that sold software. It was like advertising driven kind of technology. Um, so he he understood the problem, but couldn't 100% empathize with it. But at the end of the first meeting, he was just like, you know what, 150K, um, sort of, you guys see what you can do. Um, and there's some desks over there. If you want to move to London, move to London. And like, when you have a question, I'll point you in the right direction um, of the team internally who deals with like HR or whatever it is. And you can bribe them with, with chocolates or something um, to get an answer. And so that was really how we got kind of our start um in terms of like understanding we built a product before but we never built a business we never hired people or kind of like properly hired people or things like that we'd had freelancers and things um but then so we moved to london we start um kind of building the product and probably about nine months in we were roughly ready to launch um but like we were a bit, con- we were kind of, uh, I think as a lot of business go through, we were kind of a bit confused about who are we selling to, like what types of software company and, and things like that. And actually we got a bit kind of distracted. We were still trying to solve this problem, but then we also decided that like, oh, in order to make it compelling, we also had to build a marketplace for software. So that made the whole kind of pitch like so much more confusing than like, we're just solving this pain to also, we can get you all these new customers and, and things like that. Um, but around the time that we were going to launch, um, I started, I was talking to Mark, the guy who wrote the initial check. And he was like, a, um, he was like, I don't know if this initial kind of version is going to work. I don't know if you'll hit product market fit and all this stuff. But one of the things that would be useful for you to do is probably if you are going to scale this business, <clears throat> um, then you should probably start getting to know investors. So people who could re- lead a proper seed round or a series A eventually or, or something like that. So I forget exactly how we got introduced, but he he was he definitely facilitated this initial introduction um, to a VC firm. Um, it just so happened to be one of the largest VC funds in London, a fund called Balderton. Um, and I sort of he introduced me directly to a partner, and I kind of had a couple of back and forth over email, told him the story and, and kind of what we've done. And for some reason. Um, they thought it would be a great idea for my first ever, I didn't even know what a VC fund was before this kind of email chain. Um, but for some reason they thought it would be a great idea for my first experience in front of a VC fund would be to skip all the usual, um, kind of like back and forth with one partner or an associate or whatever, and literally just drop me straight into a Monday morning kind of full partnership meeting, um, and of between two other companies who are obviously very polished and doing their pitches and and sort of all this stuff um, to make a final decision, like just book me in for 45 minutes in uh, that one morning. And I kind of go in completely unprepared, like kind of into this room and there's like 
18 sort of people, kind of probably like 12 people on the actual investment team and then a bunch of like um, assistants and associates and, and people like that sat around this big table. And I go in and they're like, do you have a deck? Do you need like this HDMI cable? I'm like, no, was I supposed to bring a deck? Um, and kind of really just ended up having a conversation with this group of um, kind of 12, 15 investors for, for like 30, 45 minutes. And as you can imagine, like they fired questions at me of like, how are you going to scale? Like, what's the pricing look like? Unit, unit economics, kind of like, how are you going to build a sales team? And I had zero answers to any of these questions. Um, and really that meeting went as well as you could have expected. It was a complete train wreck. Um, obviously they weren't going to write a check. Um, interestingly, the thing that happened after that was, so we picked a number out of the air, which was about a million pounds. So about $1.4 million dollars. Um, that we wanted to raise, which was quite honestly, um, like or it seemed like a ridiculous amount of money for me because we hadn't launched a product yet or anything like that. Um, and kind of went out of that meeting and I was like having like a debrief with the the partner who took me in. Um, also, coincidentally, a guy called Mark um, uh, at the so end of the meeting. And he was like, he kind of like said that that went terribly. He was trying to be a little bit nice about it. He was like, that went completely terribly, complete train wreck. <laughs> Like they are not going to give you any of their money. Um, but I really like you. I like what you're doing. I think you'll figure it out. Um, and he ended up writing us a check for a million, um, just over a million pounds. So like 1.2, 1.3 million dollars personally. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So they and that happened pretty quickly that, as well. That, and that got you guys, you know, really, really emotion. Uh, but it's interesting how, all these experiences, all these unique experiences that only happened to one person, I mean, one of them, I mean, all of them have happened to you. So, I mean, even the Series B, you know, talking about sitting next to the right person at the right time on an airport. So, so what happened there? Yeah. So, I was on a, so we, when we first started the business, um, like we were, uh, like, we were building all of the, like the initial business that I started, the, the software, the invoicing software was for, um, for Mac. So it was like desktop software for Mac. Cause that was sort of what most like web designers and graphic designers and people were using. So it being like native software, um, they really liked. And I became obsessed with like Apple products. So the first set of customers, um, for paddle for all of this infrastructure that we went after were people who were building software products for the Mac or for iOS or kind of things that sync between them and, and things like that. So one of the things that we decided to do um, kind of, and this was roughly in 2017, um, we would go to Apple's developer conference every year, WWDC in um, in San Jose. I think that year was in San Francisco. Um, it's since moved to San Jose. And um, Harris, so we, we had like a reasonable amount of money. We'd raised like a series A, there is a really small series A um, in 2016, about 3 million. Um, but we were still incredibly frugal, um, as sort of hopefully most businesses are at that point. Um, so Harrison and I were flying to, um, to San Francisco to go to this conference, um, to kind of meet our customers and, and things like that. And I think it was the first time that we'd ever been. Um, so we bought like the cheapest possible flights that we could. So it was like London to New York, to New York, to Chicago, to Chicago, to San Francisco, um, and like kind of grueling, like kind of 23 hours on a plane for what could be a 10 hour flight. Um, and on the like leg of the flight after the layover from, um, I think Chicago to San Francisco, um, I sat on the plane, it was like a terrible, like middle seat as well. And it was awful. Um, and then the guy next to me on the plane got out, uh, like a MacBook, and it had a bunch of stickers on the front and like the stickers on the front were like companies, like stickers. And there was a couple on there that I like, um, recognized, like one was like go cardless and, um, another was like type form or something like that. And I was like, Oh, do you work at type form or whatever it is? This guy who's sitting next to me on the plane. And I was like, no, he was like, no, actually I'm an investor in type form. Um, and so the kind of, it's like a four hour flight or something. And basically we spent the whole four hours of like, just talking about him investing in these sort of B2B software companies, me running a B2B software company, going to sort of San Francisco to kind of get new business and things like that. And it turns out that we were both, despite this being a flight from Chicago to San Francisco, um, he was Greek, but lived in London and it was a London based sort of B2B SaaS investor. I was based in London as well. 
Um, and like, I remember, I don't know why I remember this, but very distinctly kind of, it was all like pleasant and everything gave him the pitch and, and did all that stuff. And we were walking to the, um, the baggage thing to collect our bags. And he kind of, he kind of walks off in front of me and I was like, okay, that's, I didn't even kind of, I recognized the guy's name. His name was Chris. I was like, I'm probably never going to remember me again. Um, and I remember he, he waited for me by the exit, um, where you kind of leave the airport to get your bags. And he handed me a card. Um, and sort of, I emailed him probably like six, seven hours later. Um, and as soon as we got back to London, we immediately went for lunch, continued the conversation, um, sort of from where we left off. And I think probably four months later, they ended up re- um, leading our, our series B. Wow. Wow. That's remarkable. So, so Christian, it seems that the, you know, the, all the good things, you know, like happen for a reason. And, you know, at the end of the day, you guys have been able to, to develop and to build a, a really fantastic company. You know, I guess uh, just for the people that are listening to get an idea of how big uh, Paddle is, you know, anything that you can share in terms of number of employees or anything else? Yeah, so we're about 150 people uh, right now. We'll hire about another 100 people this year. Um, we main office is in, in London. We have other offices in China, um, Australia, Ireland, and kind of the US in New York. Um, and if we're really, it's a really interesting kind of business to run, um, sort of because we power um, sort of all of the billing for a lot of SaaS companies. Um, And we're approaching kind of, we measure that in the kind of, this year will be the first year that we measure kind of that volume going through us in billions of dollars as opposed to hundreds of millions. Um, So that's kind of an exciting milestone for us. Absolutely. So in terms of talking about the future and thinking, you know, what's coming, imagine if you go to sleep tonight and you wake up in Mm -hmm. a world that is perhaps, you know, where, where that vision is fully realized. What does that world look like for Paddle? Wow. Um, I think for me, like when I really boil this down and it's, and it's sort of like the, one of the fundamental things that gets me out of bed in the morning, um, and gets me excited about what it is that we're building is I think back to sort of when I was building kind of that software company. And I think like it was actually sort of, it wasn't easy. It was definitely hard, but it was the sum of its parts, like the individual kind of components with you. Building a good product was pretty easy. There weren't, there wasn't anyone else building kind of this native invoicing software for freelancers on kind of Mac. So it was like pretty uncrowded. Um, and sort of there were a bunch of different pretty uncompetitive acquisition channels for me to go and like these partnerships and bundles and email marketing was great and sort of all of this stuff. Um, and I think back and like the thing that was, was like really holding us back was this infrastructure piece. And I fast forward to now and I think kind of like how much of that is still true today. And I think, well, it's still pretty easy to build a good product. Um, or at least it's, it's kind of, it's probably easier to build a product in terms of the infrastructure available and things like AWS and sort of all the open source frameworks and things like that. But it is far more competitive than it's ever been. Like there are, there's probably, if I were to look at it right now, there's probably 150 companies doing that invoicing software that we were trying to build back then. Um, so sort of, you really have to differentiate on providing the best possible product to people and the best possible service and experience to people at the same time. And like, really the thing that gets me up in the, in the, in the morning is, is thinking like, actually, if we were trying to build that invoicing product today and we were trying to do it without paddle, we would have been spending even less time on building a really great product and serving our customers. Cause we would still be dealing with all of these other headaches and, and things like that that existed. So for me, like it comes down to, okay, if two people were starting the same business at the same time. I like you and I, we're both going to start a project management SaaS business and you build a product that is infinitely better than mine. It's a great product, great customer experience, all this stuff. I build an inferior product with inferior customer experience. But the thing that I do do is I really nail all of this infrastructure. Like my conversion rate in every country is perfect. I have expanded into every geo and kind of, I really nailed this down and I end up being more successful than you simply because like I had the resources and the bandwidth to optimize all of this other boring stuff in the background. 
Like, I just don't think that should be the way that this goes. I think best product, best experience should win. And there should be, just like AWS has really democratized how we build software. Like it's given everybody the same set of infrastructure to start with. It's not about who can spend a million dollars on servers up front. Like I want to do the same thing for this infrastructure. So I think this problem is solved when kind of the best product with the best experience, who can go to market in the best way wins, as opposed to the person who can spend the most amount of money on business infrastructure in the background to make all of that stuff work. I love it. So one of the questions that I typically ask the guests that come on the show is, imagine if I put you into a time machine and you go back in time and have the opportunity of having a chat with that younger Christian, maybe that younger Christian that is 14 years old and that is thinking about doing something, if you had the opportunity of giving that younger Christian just one piece of business advice before launching a business, what would that be and why, given what you know now? It's a good question. I think, honestly, it would be do one thing at a time. Like... Focus on one thing at a time. It doesn't mean you can't change your mind or you can't do something different, but like focus on doing one thing at a time. I think one of the, and we did this accidentally when we started Paddle, it's like hiring somebody to run the other, other thing and then starting something new. Um, but there was definitely a ton of times, both in the first business and within Paddle, where we've tried to do too many things all at the same time and done none of them particularly well. Like whether that's expand to lots of different verticals or segments or whatever it is, I think it would be kind of, you can do all of the things that you want to do. You can do them successively. Like you don't have to do everything all at once and next month have all of these things ready for the world to see. Um, so I think that would be my number one piece of advice is, is do one thing at a time. Very profound. So Christian, for the people that are listening and watching, what is the best way for them to reach out and say hi? Uh, I'm pretty active on Twitter. It's Christian B. Owens on Twitter. I couldn't get the one without my middle initial. I'm still very annoyed about it. Um, but DM me, tweet me, um, for anything kind of paddle related, you can head to paddle.com. Amazing. Well, Christian, thank you so much for being on the Dealmaker show today. Thank you so much for having me.